1914. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife, the Duchess Sophie Hohenberg, were shot to death. August 4th, 1914. His Majesty's government has declared to the German government that a state of war exists between Great Britain and Germany as of 11 p.m. today. 
August 22nd, 1914. With widespread support, Parliament quickly passed the War Measures Act, stating, the Governor and Council may do as he may deem necessary or advisable for the security, defense, peace, order, and welfare of Canada. Germans, Austrians, Hungarians, and Turks, attention! Every German, Austrian, Hungarian, and Turk is hereby notified to report himself immediately at the office of the Registrar for Alien Enemies. Miroslav. Present, sir. Schwarze. Present, sir. Zelensky. Present, sir. Zelonik. Present, sir. Demchak. Present, sir. Olny. Present, sir. Sadowski. Present, Present sir. Kos. Present, sir. Vasilchak. Present, sir. Heine. Haimovi. Hugo. Korji. Tech. Mueller. Shafka. Vlovi. Mugrepa. Adolvin Schmidt. Moved to Canada. My wife begged a new start. That was the first time I've seen her happy in months. Things are tough back home. After all the schooling I went through in Germany, led to a whole bunch of nothing. I felt so guilty not being able to provide for my darling, and I knew when she showed me that flyer that this was our chance. A chance at a better life. Maxim and Nadia Sadowski. These days, all I seem to be is a nervous wreck. I worry all day long about my husband and the baby. I just can't bear to think that we've come this far to not emerge from the other side okay. I try to stay calm. I do this for my wife. My wife is sick with fear and worry. She's worried for me in my life. She's worried about our children. <coughs> But I am scared. For Nadia. We were taken away from our home and thrown into the burning camp. 1914. It seems so long ago. 1914, the year that everything changed. I've been employed as the doctor at the camp. I seem to hold a little bit of rank, a bit more authority than the others. They know they wouldn't survive without me. That gives me an edge. That ensures that my family is safe, that ensures that I am safe, and that is all that matters. Camp life was, well, trust me when I said it wasn't very nuts. But at least I had my beautiful, healthy family with me. Everything was bearable until 1915. October 17th. October 17th. <coughs> Tuberculosis. He won't survive the winter. That's what the doctor said. Said he won't survive the winter. I wouldn't survive the winter. What do we do? I won't let that happen. I can't leave her here. I won't leave you here. Carl Schwarze. Enticed by a promise of a bright new future, my wife Victoria and I crossed the ocean by steamship in 1910. The ocean appealed to me, so we settled in Nanaimo, where I received employment as principal of Nanaimo High School. We bought a fine piece of land and constructed a comfortable home. Gunter was born shortly after we arrived, and three years later, our lovely Carla. This new country is everything we could have dreamed of. This is my new homeland. Many of my friends have naturalized, but I've chosen to keep my German nationality. 
I'm a proud man. I'm a proud German Canadian man. It is said, pride goes before the fall. Nick or Nick. My dear wife, I'm very glad to hear that you're back from the hospital doing well, though you say you were very weak. I believe you, but I cannot help you. As you know, there are men running away from here every day. The conditions here are very poor, so poor that we cannot go on much longer. And we're not getting enough to eat. We're as hungry as dogs. They're sending us to work as they don't believe us, and we're getting very weak. Things are not good here. The weather hasn't changed for some time past. It is cold and wet and muddy, and in the tents in which we sleep, everything is wet. We get up at five o'clock in the morning and work till 10 o'clock at night. Such conditions we have here in Canada, I will never forget. Miss Edith Cavell. Two years I've worked at the camp, washing dishes, mopping floors, doing what I need to do to get the paycheck at the end of the month. I keep my head down, keeping my payments to myself as I've been advised, but God, if you could see the things that go on behind this barbed wire fence. This camp works as a living organism, and us kitchen mates, we're the heart of it. Pumping blood out to all the different departments, cleaning up everyone else's mess. We keep this place alive, and what do we get for our troubles? A whole lot of nothing. Order, discipline, and respect. That's how I run things around here. Everyone serves their role like bees in a hive. It's a bit of a hodgepodge army here at home. All the abled, bodied young men are away fighting overseas, leaving the too old, too young, and invalid soldiers here to guard the camps. Dad's army, they're calling us in town. So it falls to me to keep things in line. If I see an internee take even one step out of that line, it's straight to the black hole. We have no room for disobedience here. I keep a sharp eye on everything that goes around in this camp. Never missing a thing. Nothing gets past me. Joseph Feldman. I came here as soon as I was medically discharged from the field. I busted my leg pretty bad and they had no use for me, so they sent me here. It really changes your perspective living in a camp like this. Every day I see these families struggle from the freezing cold and famine. They did nothing wrong. They're crying? Being born in the wrong place, I guess. Even though I'm not fighting overseas, I'm still serving my country and I must follow my orders. But seeing how these people are treated in front of my own eyes really weighs heavy on my heart. I try, whenever I'm not being watched by the general, to sneak an extra apple from the mess hall out to the children in the fields. It's the least I can do. He's our favorite guard. He isn't mean or strict like the rest of them. I think if he were allowed, he would play hide and seek with me and the other children all day long. Hey, kiddo. <laughs> I thought it would be best to leave my wife back at home, spare her from this camp. I thought it was the right thing to do. But she fell ill quickly afterward, too weak to work or to take care of our children. She was sent to the hospital to recover, but the debts piled up quickly and we were left in shambles. And I'm here, stuck here, and I cannot help her. I encourage her right to the camp commandant to ask for support, or to let me free so I can come to her aid. But if her request is denied, I don't know what to do next. The Nanaimo School District fired me under suspicion of being an enemy alien. I taught my community's children for four years. Yesterday, I was a respected neighbor and teacher. Today, a prisoner behind barbed wires. I'll beat a prisoner first class. Life has become unbearable. Even though my wife is heavily with the child, we've been sent away from our home in Nanaimo to this camp in Vernon. Their family's here for Victoria to speak to, and children for Gunter and Carla to play with, but being under constant guard, surrounded by barbed wires, is enough to drive a person mad. I can't help but more for the life of my unborn child being raised in this cage. Charles 
house when I was only 16. Settled down and started a family as soon as I could. I was never happier than when I was taking care of the children and keeping the house while Charles went out to work in the office. I always made sure a big meal was on the table at supper time. I did my best and never expected anything in return. Charles is colder now. He was sweet when we were kids, but he has grown bitter with age. I sometimes worry about him. He tends to be angry nowadays, especially since the invasion of our town by the aliens. He hates those aliens with a passion. I can't help but wonder what they've ever done to him. Eleven prisoners of war are to be sent to Vernon tonight under the charge of the military authorities having been rounded up by the police. Good. Shove them in that camp where they belong. Better keep them safe in there than have them run around in our town stealing our citizens' jobs and taking over. It still perplexes me every day that they have the nerve to complain about the harsh conditions inside that camp when they, in fact, are living the high life, being provided food and water and payment for labor, a bunch of ungrateful- Charles, honey, are you going to eat? Your dinner's getting cold. I'll eat when I'm ready to eat. Of course, dear, I'm sorry. the big fence every day on our way home from school. We play spies and try to catch a glimpse of the people inside, but usually those big scary guards shoo us away first. Yesterday, we saw a big group of kids just like us running around inside the fence. I jumped real high and waved my arms, yelling to get their attention, but they just ignored me. I told Ma about it when I got home and she scolded me to never do that again. She didn't say why, but I figured asking would just upset her more. Creating roads. It's, it's forced, forced labor. labor. They get paid. We get, get paid, paid 25 cents, cents a day. day. The second class men go off to work, carving roads. I go to work, work every, every day. day. I do not. We work in the gardens, harvesting vegetables for the kitchen maids. They work so hard, harder than I've ever had to. The injustice, I wish there was something I could do. My father gets to leave the camp every day. I hope I get to go with him someday. We work out by Mara Lake. Making new roads every day. We are given one break. Just one, hungry as dogs. It is freezing. We're exhausted. But we work nonetheless. We work because we know what would happen if we don't. We try to keep our heads down. Try not to cause any trouble. Do what we're told. We have no choice. change. Good work today. Back out there again tomorrow. Yes, yes sir. sir. Bellman has a look about him. 
as if he's feeling empathy for these enemy aliens. Our job is simple. Protect our citizens from the threat of these aliens sending secrets home to aid their side of the war. He better toe the line or there will be consequences. I never could have imagined it would be this bad. I didn't sign up to look down on these men who did nothing wrong. I didn't sign up to have my loyalties questioned. I didn't sign up for this. Wouldn't believe it. Business has never been better. My tobacco's been selling like crazy to that internment camp. <laughs> Maybe those aliens are helpful after all. You see, we're selling it cheap. It entices the soldiers in the war. It entices the aliens. Gives them something to do, I guess. I'd rather not help them, but as long as I'm profiting, who gives a damn? How about you? How's the store? Never been better. A year back, I thought we were going to go under, but that camp saved us. Even bought a new suit. Having this camp in our town has definitely saved my business. I mean, our, our economy, economy is flourishing. As long as they stay in there and I keep profiting off of this, mm -hmm, I'll be happy. With all the work they're doing, clearing the roads and all, soon everyone will be traveling and taking those roads straight to Vernon. Say, what do you think they're going to do with the millions after the war? I hope they send them back to where they came from. Or better yet, keep them locked up in there. We stay in business and they stay under the government's protection. Everyone wins! <laughs> this afternoon, I noticed a woman holding a child who couldn't have been more than a few months old. She was shaking, frail. I was chilly myself in this cold, but the poor thing was using her own jacket to keep her baby warm. I found myself drawn to walk towards her, to help, to provide. Looking into my bag of groceries, I pulled out the one thing I knew she would need. A bottle of milk. I almost gasped. She looked at me with such hesitation as if I might crumble if she came any closer. I could tell she was unsure about me, but I kept my eye contact strong. If this woman could find it in her heart to help me. Charles would not like this. Sympathizing with the aliens? Despicable, he would say. I don't think he'd ever be able to look me in the eye again. But she needs this. More than Charles and I could ever need a bottle of milk. Charles may have his perspective on these people, but I could never forgive myself if I deny this woman the one thing I can so easily provide. She approached the fence, slowly looking around us to make sure she wasn't being watched. No words were exchanged between us, but the look she gave me spoke volumes. A simple nod was all it took as she placed a bottle of milk by the fence and continued on her way. I couldn't shake that interaction from my brain all that night. Her generosity. Maybe this world isn't so bad after all.
between being asleep and being awake, when I forget that I'm here, and instead I'm standing in a golden field, calm and still, warmed by a gentle sun. Every morning, I am jarred with the realization that this nightmare isn't yet over. Will it ever be over? The monotony of the days in, days out, days in and out, in and out is enough to drive a person mad. Every morning with the other single men, I light them up the mess tent. I cross rooms of mud and excrement on the makeshift boardwalks to get there. I have to endure the smell of home-cooked breakfast wafting across the camp from the northeast corner, where the first class crowds live in the bloody lap of luxury. We never get enough we to eat. We never get enough to eat. We never get enough to eat. We never get enough to eat. They never get enough to eat. We never get enough to eat. We are hungry as dogs. When we ask for more, the guards do not believe we're hungry and treat us worse than dogs. Sometimes the internees are strung so tight, the simplest thing can set off a catastrophic cascade. loses its battle in the wet, dank darkness of this living hell. Too good to be true. They lied to us. Nothing to fear, they said. <coughs> These few will this be This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. So many regrets. <coughs> he won't survive the winter. It's cold and I can't get warm. Hungry as dogs. Born in the wrong place. Why? Living hell brings in Grace House. Why not embrace it? A bottle of milk. Who are you to leave you here.
sir. Saloniac. Present, sir. Derbchuk. Present, sir. Olnik. Olnik. Present, sir. Sadowski. Present, sir. Kos. Present, sir. Vasilchuk. Present, sir. Heine. Hymovi. Hugo. Korzik. Keck. Mueller. Shafka. Vlovi. Vukrepa. Horrible, isn't it? The conditions these people are forced into for the simple crime of being born in the wrong place. Mental illness seeps into the camp. Sickness, famine, and death. Such indignity. Frustration builds and builds till eventually someone will snap. When the second class men stumbled in for dinner that night, one of the internees approached me. Fever in his eyes, kind of scary like. I keep to my own business and avoid looking at him, but all of a sudden he grabs my arm. I need your help. I don't know what to say. We can be behind the mess hall at quarter past ten tonight. Don't be late. I know this man. He was the one that got thrown into the black hole the other day. I've heard terrible stories about the black hole, and I've got no intentions of ending up in there. None at all. I questioned whether I even wanted to follow through meeting with him, but curiosity got the best of me. I finished all my nightly cleaning duties and rushed out of the hall. Arriving just on time. My name's Olenek. I've been here almost as long as you have, and I'm fed up. I can't stand another minute in this place. I have an idea to get out of here, but I'll need your help. Are you serious? The last time an escaped attempt was tried here, you- I know! Trust me, I know. But I think I can do this. It's a careful plan, and there's a farmer a few miles away that'll help us. I got a message. Okay, I'll help you, but we must be careful. Thank you. I've often thought of an escaped land, creating a perfect little series of events. A secret message here, a signal there, misdirection and subtle flirtation. With a little bit of luck and God willing, a few of these men will have their freedom. And then the penny drops. The, the Summer Festival! The annual celebration that lifts the spirits of the camp from the depths of a dark and freezing long winter to the enlightening bloom of the new season. Festivities arising all around the camp. Dancing, singing, playing, a real spectacle. A certain general might feel the celebration was his obligation to control, to make sure everything is running smoothly. No funny business from the internees under his watchful eyes. But as he stands his guard high above the rest of them, he misses the slightest of details in the fields down below. A few internees out of place, and a single kitchen maid walking quietly among them. Boys and I, with the help of Cavell, have been sneaking out late each night to tunnel further and further away from the camp from under the storage unit of the mess hall. We use all the leftover dirt in the fields the next day, leaving no trace but the bags in our eyes and grit in our hair. We're careful covering all our tracks. Couldn't say what would happen to us if we got caught. I try to lighten the mood each night, inspire the boys, chat with Cavell, but she never lets me get a word out before putting me back to work. She knows we'll come up with a series of signals to let us know when the guards are near. One of the brightest women I know, Cabell. She deserves a lot better than this place. I try to convince her to run away with us when we are ready, but for her, the risk is too high. Too bad, though. 
Sometimes I wish that Get she Get back to work! I can tell they're starting to get frustrated, and I can't blame them. I am too. The sleepless nights of all the secrecy. There have been so many close calls and far too many. Cavell has been seen around camp late at night these past couple of weeks. Nothing too out of the ordinary, and when asked, she chalks it up to sleeplessness. She's one of the good ones, and I trust her. That's mainly why I've chosen Sleeper B. But I want to talk to her, to warn her that the general is getting suspicious. Whatever she's doing, it's dangerous. Evening, Cavell. Oh, good evening, Joseph. You want to walk in again tonight? Yes. I just can't seem to sleep. I'm sure you'd understand. Of course. But you should know, there have been a few reports of suspicion made against you by some of the other guards recently. I'd like you, Cabell. Just watch your step. I appreciate your concern, Joseph, but it's really nothing. But thank you for the warning. You really are very sweet. You're trying to make us track the others, Cabell, but I know you too well. Just take care. I can tell she's protecting something. Herself? Me? But if it's something she cares so much to protect, it must be something worth protecting. I don't believe the guards could have caught on to her trail. We've been so careful, and we've left no room for error. The summer festival's next week, and these men have to be ready. been able to ask her her name, to be able to thank her for her generosity. I haven't got the words. The last time she gazed through the fence, it was a few days after my husband passed. She walked by, the same as always, offering a single bottle of milk and a smile. She could never know how much that smile meant to me that day. She used to walk by the fence so frequently, but recently it's become more and more scarce. I've missed her, her kind smile she would share with me, giving me hope carry on one day further. She saved me and my baby. It was her who got us through the winter. She gave me hope. I see the woman I visit every so often notice me through the bumble of activity. She approaches the fence and I feel guilty as I realize this time I have nothing to offer her. No milk for her child or pe piece of bread to tide her hunger. I walk towards the fence as she raises her hand up towards me. She starts searching herself for something to give me, and I speak my first words to my only friend. Please, no. She looks confused, but I simply stretch my hand out to her. I have a gift for you today. And I pass her a small bag. It's all I have to thank her with. The tears welled quickly in my eyes. I couldn't help it. I looked inside the little bag. Sunflower seeds. I squeeze her hand, reassuring her, and we smile at each other. I wait till she lets go, and then I go back to the field. Something feels different. So 
Something's changed. There's hope.
parties out scouring the country for the fugitives since Sunday morning, but so far without locating any of them. The tunnel through which the prisoners escaped was not yet discovered until a large bread box moved in the kitchen when the opening beneath it was disclosed. Evelyn, have you read the news? No, Charles, why? What's going on? Those sons of bitches escaped! Twelve of them the night they were holding that stupid festival. They got all the matches out on the lookout, think they're headed south towards the state. Can't believe it, those good-for-nothing aliens! I can tell Charles is starting to get a bit temperamental. Just running away from the security that this town has so graciously provided them? Isn't anything enough for them? I try and calm him down before he takes it too far, but I can never seem to calm him down. Why don't they go back to where they came from? What do they expect? To come here, steal our land and our jobs and our food and be welcome? I hope they make it. I really hope they make Why it. Why don't they go back to where they came from, those filthy- Charles, please! What did you say to me? I... I said, please, those are people locked up in there, and they did nothing wrong, nothing. Please, for once, just think of someone other- Don't ever talk back to me again, understood? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Treating war as one big game of winners, winners and, and losers. losers. When in the end, will we all lose? Picking sides of history, we will fight to the death just to say we won. Two simple words that have driven civilization to unforgivable deeds played out before our very own eyes. Take, Take a, a second. second. Step back. See a pattern form. 1914. Canadian internment camps for European citizens. 1932. The Soviet government uses systematic starvation to kill 10 million Ukrainians in the Holodomor genocide. 1942. Canadian internment camps for Japanese and Italian citizens. While in Europe, 6 million Jews killed in concentration camps. 1970. Khmer Rouge kills 3 million Cambodians. 1990. In Rwanda, 20% of population exterminated. 9-11. Almost 3,000 people die in the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City, which launches the war on terror. Over the next 10 years, 37 million people in Muslim nations are displaced by the U.S. And still going on around the world today. today. Genocide of more than 100,000 Shiite Muslims. Darfur Sudan. 500,000 killed. Xinjiang, China, 1.5 million killed. Canada, more than 1,200 missing and murdered indigenous women. We, we say we will remember. That this will never happen again. But these atrocities are happening. We judge one another based on the color of our skin, our religions and traditions, or by the country where we were born. Century, century by century, century, decade by decade, as time turns on, you'd think we'd learn from our mistakes. But 
We are forgetful beings, and sadly, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Today we remember. Miroslav. Sportse. Zelensky. Saloniak. Denchak. Olenek. Sadowski. Kos. Vasily Chuck. Heine. You go. Cat. Mueller. Shopka. Sander. Lowly. 